five statistical illusions that uncover why your back tests are misleading. I'm Manu, also known as Coastal Traders on Twitter. I also run Unbiased Trading, an agency where you can back test and automate your own trading strategies. Now, number one is data snooping. This occurs when you're overfitting a strategy to noise in the data by commonly testing too many parameters with your optimization, such as using 50 parameters on just two years of historical data. A good way to avoid this is to focus on simplicity and use out of sample testing and logical parameters. To expand upon this a bit, um, primarily where data snooping is most commonly uh, found is when you are doing machine learning over a historical data set. Um, this is often because it's very easy to overfit when using machine learning models. Um, so this is number one why data snooping uh, occurs, but it can also occur on a manual side of things if you're just doing an optimization script uh, where you're just running through all the parameters, or as I mentioned, using a ton of parameters, like 50 parameters on just two years of historical data. Um, realistically, if you're using that many parameters, you would need a lot of data for that not to be overfitted uh, in most cases, especially if you're running optimization. Um, so this will also lead to further points where Normally, smaller amount of parameters equal more robust systems. That's not always the case. You can have a scenario where you underfit, where you mean you have too little parameters or you haven't done enough optimization at all, where there's basically no alpha. Um, but for the majority side of things, you normally want to decrease the amount of parameters rather than increase. It's very easy to build a strategy with more parameters than there is with less. Uh, so most of the time you're trying to run things like parameter sensitivity um, testing, where you can really see what parameters hold the most weight, and then you can use less parameters from there. Um, obviously, be careful with overfitting as well with any optimizations. Um, if you want to be very stringent and very strict, try and not optimize more than once or twice on a particular set of data and try and not use the same set of data for multiple strategies um, if it's going to be on the exact same parameters and time frame and things like that. Next is survivorship bias. This one's incredibly uh, apparent, especially when you're using code. So when you include it happens when you only include stocks or assets that are still trading, excluding ones that have gone bankrupt or been delisted. This, this can significantly alter backtest results by missing trades on stocks that have disappeared. Always use point in time data. Um, primarily, that's just making sure to use a good data provider that actually has um, all those stocks still in its historical data and they're not removed from that sample at all. Um, this can also happen in other cases. I think it's most common where you're doing like a, a long only strategy um, for the most part and you're only taking uh, trend following sort of trades and, and when you're only using a data set that only has those still listed stocks, it can be a very misleading result compared to when you actually fill in all the stocks that have gone bankrupt or delisted uh, and then still apply that trend following signal over it. Uh, it can also happen when you're just picking like, for example, I saw a backtest recently and someone just picked NVIDIA and they did a very simple long only uh, trend following strategy. And, you know, it's, it's hard to say there that that isn't so, sort of hindsight trading to some extent because you already know the outcome of NVIDIA because of the crazy pub, um, publicity around it recently and just the crazy all-time highs. Um, so it can be a case being made there if you only did a long-only strategy and it only worked on NVIDIA and not other tickers and there wasn't uh, other markets it really worked on, then that probably realistically is an overfit um, strategy as well. Three is cost underestimation. Many traders overlook realistic trading costs in their backtest. This is an oversight that is easy to fix, but it can be uncomfortable to reveal the numerous backtests that turn unprofitable when you actually account for it. Always include commissions, slippage, spread, etc. As I mentioned, this one's pretty simple to understand why this would cause an issue with your backtests. If you are not putting in those fixed costs and variable costs that come around with trading, it can pretty much make any strategy look good. Um, especially when you're dealing with strategies that ha have high number amount of trades uh, and normally are being executed very quickly. If you don't take into account those costs, it can make the trading, um, it can make the strategy look really profitable when it actually isn't uh, in, in real life. So making sure to account for your commissions, make sure those commissions are actually accurate. I've seen you know, even academic papers that really underestimate the amount of commission uh, cost for that particular strategy. Now, obviously nowadays we do have some things like commission-free brokerages, um, which can be really advantageous if as long as you make the argument why that um, broker is being used and making sure you understand that because you are using that broker, you're probably gonna have less as good execution uh, because of it being a free commission brokerage. Next is slippage. Slippage is a very common one. Pretty much as your size increases, there's gonna be more slippage. Most of the time it's quite correlated. Uh, and there's also such thing as like large impact fury, which is just because the amount of size you're trading, that's gonna impact the markets itself, which is, can then you know cause issues as well. Um, so you want to make sure you account for normal slippage. I assume most people here aren't trading incredible size. Um, so most of the time you just wanna 
get at least a rough average of that slippage. Um, there are multiple ways you can calculate slippage. Some are more mathematical, some are more easier uh, to approach if you're new to back, back testing. Uh, normally what I'd say is just apply either um, a percentage of ATR, or you could just apply a flat percentage or a flat amount of ticks uh, to each trade to slippage. And then you can map it out as I've kind of done on this equity curve where you can see how the different amount of slippage here affects the results. Now, obviously it's gonna be very simple to understand that as you apply more slippage, the results can be worse, which makes sense, but it's good to visualize it and see, okay, once we get to around 2%, let's say of slippage of that ATR, that's when the strategy really starts to not perform as well. Um, and it gives you a really good expectation to understand, especially when you're live trading it as well. Um, obviously you can have spread as well. Spread normally is more apparent when you're trading a liquid um, sort of um, instruments. So if you're trading like maybe meme coins that aren't on big volume, OTCs, things like that, that is gonna have a lot more spread that you're gonna have to account for. Um, and then lastly there, you've got other costs that come in, can come into it. So like locates, uh, if you're doing shorting, um, sometimes, you know, depending on the strategy, I guess this is a very niche case, but depending on the strategy, if you have to pay a lot for a certain amount of data um, that is hard to come by, then you should really account for that in your strategy as well, that, hey, I'm having to pay, you know, if it, I've seen some data sets where you can have to pay like 10,000 a year. Um, now, probably at that size, it doesn't really matter that much to your baseline, but it's still good to account for to understand that that's part of your costs. For look ahead. So as Ernest Chan notes, this is a common programming mistake. I've also seen traders make this error when using Excel, like if and or conditions, to analyze data. It happens when future information is used that wouldn't have been available at the time of the trade. I think the most common for this that I've seen uh, for very beginner traders is you will look at the end of day volume and then say, oh, okay, so if it has this much volume, I don't want to trade it. Um, and necessarily you're not going to know that volume until end of day. Now there could be a case be made there that if the stock hits that amount of volume earlier in the day, then you can stop trading it, for example, or something like that. That could be totally true. Um, another classic one is using the highs and lows of a day before they've even actually been formed. So you're never actually going to be able to know what the ultimate high and low is of the day, which makes pretty much uh, any statistical relevance to it pretty uh, lackluster, unless you're using it saying that if it breaks current high of day um, at a certain time, then there's a statistic around it that could work as well. Um, then you have more classic look ahead biases like executing on the same bar as the signal uh, and at the open of that bar, that's a very classic one I've seen people do in code. Um, so making sure you always execute after all conditions have been met and then on the open or close of that bar makes a lot more sense, uh, especially because there normally will be a lag depending on how many calculations you're putting. So let's say you're having to work out a lot of things, it may not be realistic that you're gonna get filled on the close of that bar and you're gonna have to wait until the open or you know a bit after that bar, uh, the next bar, sorry, is uh, open. So this one's very common, uh, can happen a lot of times. Uh, I'd say just the easiest way to prevent this is just to double check all your code, double look for it, look at it on a chart. Um, and just once you've become aware of look ahead biases, it's easier to catch most of the time. Um, you know, still sometimes when I'm coding my own back test, I'll make a mistake because I'm rushing or something like that, or maybe I'm a bit distracted, um, but just make sure to always go over it again. And the easiest way I'd say, for people to know if you have a look at bias is by the equity curve. If you run a back test and then you have an equity curve that just looks like a straight line going up, then hey, you, you maybe made a mistake. Or if it just looks a bit too good to tr be true, it's always worth double checking. It's never worth just taking it on face value and saying, oh wow, it looks like an amazing equity curve, let's just put it live. Always verify your code and double check it. Five is time period bias. This occurs when conclusions are based on insufficient or cherry pick data, like backtesting in OTC long strategy only in 2020 and 2021. Now you wanna test strategies across multiple market cycles, ideally over five plus for statistically significant results. Um, this one's pretty self-explanatory, but I see a lot of the time, uh, especially when people haven't moved to coding yet for some of the backtesting, or maybe they don't have the capabilities or money for it, is that they'll only backtest over the data they've sampled. So, you know, we'll, we'll, put, a, we'll put aside the limitations and downsides of manual um, data collection. Let's say you've only done some data collection or you somehow found data for 2020. Um, that's a very irregular year for a lot of strategies. And it's not really a good representation of how that strategy would actually work in other years. So a year of data sounds like a lot to newer traders, but realistically, if it's a cherry picked year or it's a irregular year, it doesn't really make that much sense. You really wanna be able to test it over many, multi, uh, many market cycles. So that's why I normally advocate for at least five years because five years normally gives you a good amount of time with different market cycles, especially because of how crazy the markets have been recently in past years. Um, but to be even better, you'd wanna go 10, maybe 20 years depending um, to really test that strategy over time. Now, 
there is a conversation there where people say, oh, but you know, maybe the strategy isn't going to work uh, when it's so far back because of the variables that are being used or something like that. That is totally true. But then you can base that into your expectations. If I run a strategy and I don't expect it to do very good in like uh, 2015 because there wasn't as much volume, then I'm not expecting as high a return. If it's just profitable at all, then that's pretty much a good result for me. Um, there is a whole thing here that I, I won't get into too much, but you can also change those variables to be um, representative during those previous years. Uh, so if you're looking for X amount of volume, you could, you could find the median volume and then you know change it to that, for example, stuff like that. But um, anyway, when you're best backtesting over that many years, you want to be realistic. You don't need to see you know crazy results every single year, especially if they aren't years where that strategy would you know really perform well in. Um, it's totally fine to have a you know an OTC OTC strategy if you backtested it over five years of data and 2020 was an incredible year for it. That makes sense. It was a really good environment for that particular strategy. But you also wouldn't want to see that every other year it's just lost money. You'd want to see that it's you know consistently somewhat being profitable. But those years were really good years and those were outlier years. That would make a lot of sense. Additionally, here you you're going to need more years of data if you have a lower sample uh, strategy. So if you have a strategy that's only taking two trades per year, you're going to need a lot of years years of data. Um, whereas if you have a strategy that is, you know, taking hundreds of trades each week, then you may have a reason that you won't need as much data. Um, but still, I would like it over multiple market cycles just to really get an idea of what ones it performs best in, how it um, draws down in other ones, etc., and things like that. If you find this sort of content valuable, feel free to follow me on Twitter at Ghost of Trades. Uh, otherwise, please subscribe and have a great day.